that make decisions that are really wrong, and there are some well-known historical examples of that. The one that Yanis studied was the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, where uh, President Kennedy, together with his most senior advisors, came to the conclusion that the CIA should uh, try to make uh, Fidel Castro's regime fall by invading the Bay of Pigs, and it completely went wrong, even though these were all very smart people. Another more recent example was the invasion of Iraq, where uh, a committee of CIA and politicians and military men had kind of convinced themselves that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Afterwards, it turned out that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that probably the result was that there was a kind of a grouping process in which all the arguments for why there should be weapons of mass destruction got reinforced and reinforced, and all the arguments for why they should not be were kind of pushed down. This, again, it's unfortunate that the picture is missing. This is a simulation that my colleague Frank van Overwell made of a process of uh, polarization. I'll try to sketch it to you. What he did was he had a one-dimensional variable going from position one, the extreme position in the one, to a position minus one, the extreme position in the other one. He started by giving his agents more or less random positions between one and minus one, but slightly more towards the plus one than towards the minus one. And what you see is that when all the agents communicate together, they all move towards the position plus, the plus position, and they move to an average that's more, much more than the average of the agents there. So you clearly see this polarization happening. Then there was a second simulation where now he split up the agent between two groups, the ones that were plus, that means more than zero, and the ones minus, the ones that were less than zero, and he restricted the communication between the two groups. What you saw in this case was that there was, again, a homogenization within the majority group, the plus, and the homogenization between, in, within the minority group, but the two groups did no longer homogenize with each other. They no longer agreed with each other. And then the third simulation there, he cut off uh, communication completely between the two groups. Again, the two groups homogenized, but now they homogenized at an even bigger distance. The, the difference in their opinions at the end was even bigger. So here you can very nicely see this process that if there is more communication between different opinions, there is a tendency towards homogenization, towards polarization. If there is less communication, that tendency is suppressed and you get subgroups with different opinions. So to summarize, we have here a very important mechanism of self-organization that I call homogenization. It can be positive, it can be negative. It is positive if you need to agree about something, and the thing you need to, to agree about it is basically not so important what it is. If you have to agree about we will all drive on the right-hand side of the road or we will all drive on the left-hand side of the road, both positions are equally valuable. It doesn't matter which one you choose. The only thing that matters is that you all choose the same. This is typically a situation in language. You have some new concepts, for example, a new invention. You need to invent a word for it. Whether you call it ABC or you call it DEF doesn't really matter. The different words are essentially equivalent. What matters is that you all agree about the same word. In what case is homogenization bad? If you lose diversity, if there are certain positions that have advantages, and by homogenizing, by reaching a consensus on one position, you forget about the good arguments for the other positions. That's the problem of groupthink. So, we need to find some kind of middle ground. In some cases, this homogenization is good. In some cases, we should make sure it doesn't happen too quickly. And in order to avoid it to happen too quickly, we should somehow suppress this mechanism of uh, nonlinear amplification. Uh, since I see it's already getting later, I will go relatively quickly over the next slide, which are all examples of this process. 
Uh, one example that's particularly relevant for communication and linguistics is the process of developing common references. You have to communicate with somebody about something that a priori you don't have a word ready for, and the typical experiment they do is they give people a task that they jointly need to do. For example, they have to find their way to a labyrinth, but they can't both work on the same labyrinth, they work both on a computer terminal, they can communicate with each other, but they can't point towards the labyrinth. So they have to reach conventions like saying, uh, go to the top right, and then they should both agree to what top right means. It depends on what is right for the one, what is top for the one. They need to agree about a common ground, about a common reference. So what typically happens is that some person starts to make an explanation and then the other kind of give feedback to see whether he understands it. If the explanation is not clear, the explanation is changed. And after many rounds of back and forth, they tend to agree about a way to designate the thing they are speaking about. And uh, they typically come to a single word in the end of saying, that's the thing. There are some experiments, like for example, uh, Simon Gerd has done very in interesting experiments. And some experiments have been simulated in this uh, talking net simulation that uh, I did with my colleague Frank van Overwaller. This, unfortunately, again, uh, lacking picture is an example. Here, the two parties had to describe some strange shape, a strange shape that they started by describing. It looks like a martini glass with legs. And then the moment that both parties kind of agree about what they mean by a martini glass with legs, they start speaking about the martini glass-like thing, the martini glass, martini, and in the end they just say martini and they both know what they mean. They have established a consensus, they have established a common reference. And in the simulation, the agents were very much doing the same. They were agreeing on the same thing, and what they were agreeing on typically was much shorter than what they started out with. This same process can now be generalized not just to a single word to describe some new phenomenon, but to lots of words. And this is the famous talking heads experiment of Luke Stales. Here you have a number of uh, software or hardware agents, that means kind of simple robots. These agents need to develop a common vocabulary. Each agent can recognize certain things. For example, they can recognize squares, circles, triangles. And for each of these concepts, they have a word, and that word is typically a random combination of letters. But the different agents, a priori, don't have the same words for the same things. So they try to communicate. And one agent says, the word that it has for, let's say, a square, and the other agent then kind of indicates whether it understands it or not. They can see whether they agree if they both point at the same thing, then they know that they agree. If they point at two different things, they know they disagree. What is the alignment dynamics in this case? If they both agree, if they point at the same thing, both of their words are reinforced, they become stronger. If they disagree, both of their words are weakened and they learn to shift a little bit their position towards the other one. So if the one uses the word UXP for a square and the other one uses the word BAA for a square, the one that uses BAA will also a little bit start to associate it with UXP and vice versa. The next time they interact with a different agent, the same process goes on and all the different agents have lots of interactions called language games. The end result, if you do this for a very, very many times, but of course with computers you can do it, you can have them play thousands of rounds of interactions, the end result is that they develop a common vocabulary, a common vocabulary meaning that they have words that they basically agree about. There's a minimum of disagreements, there's a minimum of ambiguity, there are still a few homonyms and a few synonyms, but most words have unique me meanings. So this is a very nice uh, simulation of the origins of uh, language. 
This was a picture of the talking heads experiment where you see the two robotic agents looking at the squares, the tiles, and so on. You can find the picture on the web if you want. It's uh, not really necessary. The next uh, paradigm I want to speak about is uh, the game that's known as Chinese Whispers. It's a game in which one child typically tells something, tells a sentence to another child, but in such a way that only the one to whom he speaks can hear it. The second one tells it to the third one. The third one tells it to the fourth one. And then at the end, when the last one is done, the last one tells it again to the first one, and the first one compares what he originally said with what the last one says, and typically there is a very big difference. It's completely different. It has completely changed. It's a very nice game, and it's a nice paradigm to uh, explain what I call memetic transmission. What is transmitted, the piece of information that is transmitted, is what is called a meme. A meme is an ID, a piece of information that is transmitted from person to person. It could be, for example, a story, an anecdote, a joke that is told from person A to person B, from person B to person C, etc. This experiment of Lyons and Kashima that I mentioned was an experiment in this style. The experimenters invented a story about a uh, hypothetical tribe, the Jamaeans, and they tell the story where a Jamaean boy went into the woods and he saw a bear and he climbed in a tree and he threw with a stone towards the bear. So there were lots of elements in the story and they told it to the first person, the first person had to tell it to the second person and so on. And at the end, the last person told the story and then they would systematically compare the last story with the original story and see what has happened. What happens, of course, is that each time the story is told on, there is some slight variation. There, is, there are some mistakes, some things are left out, some things maybe are added, some things are a little bit exaggerated or changed. In the final version, there will be some elements that have lost out, that have been eliminated. We could see that within the paradigm of self-organization as the result of friction. Friction means an interaction that doesn't work well, where there is some conflict, where there is some uh, dissatisfaction. Some of the elements clearly did not fit in well with this interaction. On the other hand, we will also see that the final version will have some elements that have either been added or have been amplified, they have been exaggerated, they have become more prominent in the final story. These are elements that you might say that have some kind of a synergy with the process of communication. They kind of fit in well with the people telling it from the one to the not one. So this process is a process of evolution, of natural selection, in which after a while the elements that survive are the elements that are fit in the terminology of evolutionary theory. Fit, that means that they are adapted to the process of communication. That means they are adapted to the cognitive systems of the individuals that are telling them and to the language that they use to communicate. This process is a process that explains a lot about the evolution of common knowledge. Common knowledge that might be, for example, myths, legends, rumors, but also all kind of shared culture, things that we all know, common sense things, stereotypical things, the kind of things that everybody knows, but nobody really knows who started it out, or who invented it, or who discovered it. I have done a lot of research on what are the criteria for a meme to be fit. I will not mention all of them, I will just mention the ones here. First, simplicity. That was also clear in the Lions and Kashima experiment. You start by telling a relatively complicated story with a number of details. At the end of the chain, many of the details that were not so important have been left out. It's normal. People cannot remember everything, cannot understand everything. They tend to simplify. Second criterion, coherence. If I tell you something that doesn't fit in with your own understanding of the world, you will to start with not understand well what, what I say, you may not believe it, you will be very skeptical. In other words, you're unlikely to remember what I tell you and to tell it further to somebody else. If I tell you that, for example, that my car was made by little green men from Mars, 
you may say, what a strange guy is that? But you will not believe that and you will not tell to others, do you know that his car was made by little green men from Mars? Things that are incoherent typically will not pass on well. In the case of the Lions and Kashima experiment, it was established in the following way. They not only told the story about the Jamaicans, they also gave some background information about who these Jamaicans were. And they gave some general characteristics. For example, the Jamaicans are very intelligent and very peaceful. And then in the story, there is, for example, an episode where a Jamaican boy throws stones at a bear. That's kind of inconsistent with the idea that they are peaceful. So they typically noticed that the elements that were inconsistent with the background were left out, while the elements that were coherent with the background, for example, the boy climbed in a tree that was a smart way to escape from the bear, that element would survive. An aspect that's particularly important for language research, in order to communicate, you need a language, you need a terminology, you need a vocabulary. If you want to express something that is difficult to formulate in language, it will not pass on well. It will, may be misunderstood, it may be, uh, it may be uh, people will simply not explain it to others because they don't find the word. So if you have a particular word for a phenomenon, that phenomenon will be much more easy to incorporate in your uh, story than if you don't have a word. Another uh, linguistic criterion on which I did quite some research with a linguist uh, colleague of mine, Jean-Marc de Waal, it's a concept of formality. It's a little bit too complicated to explain here, but the idea of formality, the way we define it, is that an expression is formal if it is independent of the context. If I tell you, I saw it there, this is an expression that you would have to know everything about the context to understand what I mean. You have to know who is I, where is there, what did you see? On the other hand, if I tell you Francis Heiligen saw the Eiffel Tower in Paris, you don't need the context to know what I mean. So if I tell a story from person to person and some of the elements are dependent on the context in which I tell the story, it's quite likely that the next person who tells the story will be in a different context. That element will no longer make sense. Either the element is left out or the element is turned into a more formal version, a more explicit version. Another very important criterion is novelty. That is the idea that communication normally is informative. If we tell something to somebody, we want that person to learn something new. We are not going to tell him something he already knows. It is a very basic cognitive mechanism that everything that is unexpected, that is new, will attract the attention. If something unexpected happens, I will pay a lot of attention to it and I will be inclined to tell it to other people. If the thing that happens is what I expect to happen, I will pay much less attention to it and will be much less inclined to tell it to others. Finally, in my list here, I have the kind of obvious criteria of utility. If information is useful, if you can do something with it, you're more likely to remember it and to tell it to others. Let's go back to the problem of collective intelligence. Collective intelligence, as I said, is a question of aggregating, integrating, synthesizing diverse experience, because as a group, hopefully we know more as a single individual but at the same time avoiding the process of polarization or groupthink. That means suppression of all the, uh, the, the ideas that, are, that diverge from the majority ID. Now, happily in those criteria I just mentioned, there is one criteria that kind of counterbalances this tendency to conformity, the tendency to reach a consensus no matter what. It is the criterion of novelty. If people in a group start talking, they typically will start by trying to establish common ground, to reach a consensus, to show that they all are willing to collaborate, that they are willing to agree, to compromise. That's, let's say, the first dynamic. It's a dynamic towards homogenization. But if then the discussion has gone on for a while and it is clear that they all are willing to collaborate, they all agree about what is the problem and what are the major options, then people will typically start 
putting in new knowledge. They will start in with new ideas because they don't want to just repeat what everybody has already said. They want to add something informative. So at that moment, they start sharing experiences that may be unique, experiences that one person has and that nobody else has. So this novelty criteria, to some degree, counterbalances this tendency towards conformity. And that is the balance between this striving for novelty and this striving for conformity, where ideally you will get the right balance so that you have collective intelligence. So in a group meeting, you hope that that will happen you first agree at least about what the problem is, and then you hope that everybody will come up as much as possible with unique insights. One classical method to do that in group discussions is called the Delphi procedure. The Delphi procedure is a method in which different people have to uh, give their opinion, but independently of each other. And then a moderator collects all the opinions, aggregates them, and sends them back to everybody so that there is a minimum of mutual influence and a minimum of pressure to conform to what the others say. And the Delphi procedure typically works much better than a group discussion. The disadvantage is that it's a long and slow process. It's, uh, it takes much more time and work than a group discussion. So are there methods to boost this uh, collective intelligence in a simpler way? Well. I will finish with a last example of a group discussion. That's the experiment that I have been performing together with a student of mine. Uh, it's a very interesting experiment. We haven't completely analyzed the data yet, but what we get is very promising. So I will just end with a few hypotheses of what's going on here. The experiment, it's a, it's, a, it's a group discussion where we ask people what they think is Import, what are the factors that contribute to happiness? So we assume everybody has experience with happiness. So you don't need to be an expert to know something about happiness. You may, for example, know that eating nice food can make you happy, or being in love can make you happy, or being in a peaceful place can make you happy. So everybody has some experience. And what we did is we made a list of 20 factors which from the literature on happiness research, and it's quite an extensive literature. Uh, I, am, uh, I am a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Happiness Studies, so I know that literature. So I made a list of the typical factors, and that was on my next slide, unfortunately, again, one of the slides that don't come to. I will quickly read you the list of possible factors. Youth, being young, status, having a status that is not lower than the other people, wealth, having enough money, friendship, having good friends, coincidence, having either good luck or bad luck, peace, living in a country without military threat, freedom, living in a democratic free country, equality, not being discriminated, sunny nature, meaning that you have a character that's optimistic by nature, Autonomy, being able to make your own decisions, having your life in your own hands. Family, having children. Emotional stability, meaning not being neurotic, stressed or anxious. Intelligence, having a high IQ. Health, not being ill. Education, having a sufficiently high level of education. Social participation, being a member of different groups like uh, churches, sports clubs, state unions. Worldview, having a clear philosophy or religion. Relationships, having a stable partner. Safety, living in a place where there is a low risk of accident or crime. And finally, trust, being able to trust other people. For each of these factors, there is quite a lot of statistical, sociological, psychological research that establishes how important these factors are. So what we did is the following. We had a group of subjects, typically university students, like in most experiments. We gave them individually that list, and we let them score each factor on a scale from one to seven. One meaning it has no relevance at all for happiness. Seven means it is crucial for happiness. Four meaning it has some importance, but it's not the most important. 
So we collected these calls for all the people individually. Then we put them together and let them discuss it. After the discussion, which lasted, I think, about an hour, we asked them again to fill in the same form. Interestingly, their scores were different. <coughs> what we also did is we invited four experts in happiness, people who have been busy with this kind of research, who know the statistics, to fill in the same forms. And we took the average of the expert scores as a kind of a measure of what hopefully would be a good solution to the problem of the happiness factors. Now, very interesting results is we compared the three scores. There is a score before the discussion, the score after the discussion, and the score of the experts. After the discussion, we saw that the opinions became more homogeneous. There are several statistical me measures like, for example, standard deviation and others that you can use to see in how far the scores of the different individuals are more similar or more di different. Not surprisingly, as you could expect from the mechanism of homogenization, after the discussion, they were more similar. There was less variation in the scores. But now, more interesting, if we took the average opinion before the discussion and after the discussion, we saw that the average opinion after the discussion was much closer to the opinion of the experts than before. That is kind of unexpected. The people in the discussion had no access to the expert. They had no access to the literature. So they couldn't be influenced by some outside data. They worked only with, their, with what they already knew. So they didn't learn anything new as a group during the discussion. The only thing that happened was that they exchanged opinion. So there was somewhere a process of collective intelligence. As a group, they became more intelligent in the sense that they made a better decision. And they did not move towards groupthink. Groupthink would have been the opposite, collective stupidity, that the collective uh, opinion would have become worse. So I'll end with some hypotheses. This is all very preliminary. Why in this experiment uh, didn't the, it go bad? Did it uh, move in the, uh, in, the, in the right direction? First, why would people become better after discussion? Well, by discussing with others, first they were to, forced to reflect more intensely about the subject. It's a subject they already knew, but obviously it's not something you continuously think about. What makes me happy? You have an intuition about it, but you don't think too deeply about it. By hearing the others and by arguing with them, you have to reflect more deeply. You also hear that different people have different opinions. The one may say, well, having a partner is not so important. Uh, I have a partner. I don't have a feeling that it makes much difference. And then you hear the opinion of somebody who is very unhappy because he does not have a partner. So you may start to say, well, actually, yes, having a partner, maybe I take it for granted, but it is really very important. So, you, you hear alternative viewpoints and you kind of get a more rich, more detailed view of the problem. Another particular aspect of our discussion was that we gave the people that list of factors before and after the discussion. So the list of 20 factors was something that kind of was on the back of their mind. So it was a way for them to remember that happiness is not a single thing. It is a multidimensional thing. There are many different factors. So it would, would make it, it would make it difficult for them to prematurely converge on one solution and say, happiness is health and nothing else. That was kind of difficult because they had in their mind all these other factors. Another typical thing of our experiment, I don't know whether it has something to do with it, it may have an effect, is that we chose students from the same group. The students knew each other, they understood each other, they spoke the same language, they trusted each other. That means that there was less need for them to establish this common ground. We see that in group discussion, there is first always this tendency to go towards a consensus to establish common ground so that people feel at home and feel that 
they can collaborate with the others. That wasn't necessary here. They knew each other, they knew they could collaborate. So there was a priori and no need to resolve friction. They could immediately start by putting in the novel information from group experiments. Typically, we find that the novel information tends to come towards the end. After people have established common ground, then they start with the new information. In this case, that wasn't necessary. They could immediately start with unique viewpoints. And finally, a factor that may have helped was that we didn't ask them to come to a decision. We said it would be good if you move towards a consensus, but we didn't ask them to tell us that's our conclusion. Happiness is most important dependent on health. We didn't ask them anything like that. So in that sense, there was more of kind of a freedom to, to remain independent, to brainstorm. I'll end with my conclusion for the whole talk. Complex systems are very uh, applicable to social systems. Groups consist of individuals that interact. Interacting agents, by definition, form a complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems have a tendency to self-organize. In the best case, what the self-organization will lead to is first homogenization on those things where you need to reach some kind of a consensus, some kind of a standard. You need to reach agreement about words, about terminologies, about certain simple rules. Better yet, you don't only want to reach consensus, you want to reach collective intelligence. That means that you want not just to agree about a majority position, but you want to develop something new, something that is more than the sum of the parts, something where the group as a whole can solve more complex problems. That means that you need some kind of a synthesis of the different experiences. And eventually, and that's a topic that I need to do f more research on uh, and that I haven't discussed here, you want to reach distributed cognition, that means you want to reach a system where there is a division of labor, a workflow, so that information processing is done in the most efficient, most intelligent way. So these general mechanisms of self-organization, I'm convinced, explain a very great number of phenomena in the whole domain of social systems, groups, communication, language, culture. I have given just a few examples, but I'm sure you can all think of many more examples. Uh, what I just need to add is that it's a very interesting paradigm, but it needs a lot of further research. It's a very complex domain, of course. We need many more experiments, many more simulations, many more theoretical analyses like the ones I have offered here. So I hope this is kind of a good starting point for a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hagen. It's a wonderful... It doesn't work. <laughs> no, it's not. No? Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Heilichen, for this uh, wonderful speech. <laughs> no. Ens ha, ens ha donat una idea claríssima del, uh, uh, del que suposa treballar amb el marc de la complexitat, eh? des de la, lligant tots els camps de la ciència, des de la física fins a la psicologia, el llenguatge, la sociologia. I uh, obrim ara un torn de paraules, per si voleu fer alguna pregunta, hi ha traducció simultània, o sigui, no hi ha cap problema, la podeu fer amb la llengua que, que us convingui més. Eh? I en acabar el torn de paraules anirem a esmorzar. Yes,
Well, um, I, uh, I have a question because uh, it's, it's just a detail uh, of your experiment. I don't want to question the, queer, uh, the, the experiment. It's, it seems very interesting. But one uh, uh, factor, is what, you, what you mentioned, it was intelligence uh, for happiness. I just would like to question this as a happiness factor. Just an, for me, it would be more an unhappiness factor because you become aware of what is going on. If, if you're not so intelligent, you have more possibility to be happy. Uh, well, I use intelligence in a very broad sense. As I said, intelligence is the ability to reach your goals. You have a particular situation. You do the right thing. That is what I call intelligence. So it's a very broad definition. It does not mean necessarily that it's some kind of a logical or rational or uh, mathematical intelligence. It can be very intuitive. It can be very emotional. And collective intelligence in this case means uh, mobilizing the useful experiences. Everybody has experiences with uh, happiness. It's a question of mobilizing them. That means getting them out and formulating them in a way that the others understand them and that the others can deal with them. So just remember that my term of intelligence does not mean purely rational reasoning. Thank you. I thank your stimulating presentation. I have um, some questions to, to pose. My first question is, uh, do responsibility and reliability ha play any role in uh, a complex system? Or um, is responsibility just to converge towards the um, so-called common um, goal. Uh, you, uh, you want me to because, answer uh, now? Uh, my second question is: What are the limits of the uh, of the system? How are they defined? And my uh, last question is about uh, collective intelligence. I understand that collective intelligence is always local intelligence. I mean, several uh, systems or subsystems may have different uh, collective intelligence. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, collective intelligence implies consensus, different groups having different consensus may enter into conflict precisely because they have uh, consensus. Is that the case? Uh, yes, so about your first question, I'm not sure what you mean by responsibility or reliability. At the level of the system as a whole, uh, complex systems are more robust. That also means more reliable, more dependable. And uh, last year I was at a workshop where they were specifically speaking about self-organization and dependability. How can you make a system more reliable, more dependable by making it self-organizing? There is, there is a lot of literature about that. So self-organization definitely helps with reliability. For the individuals within the system, if the system is self-organizing, it means that not all the individuals need to be reliable. There may be some individuals who don't play the game, who don't want to participate. If it's a really self-organizing system, the ones who do play the game will make up for the ones who don't. That's, again, a big advantage of a self-organizing system. It's the aspect of distribution or collectivity. If you have lots of agents doing it, the fact that a few of them don't do what they're supposed to do is not a grave problem. Uh, your second question was about the limits. I suppose you mean the boundaries of the system. As always in systems theory, the boundaries are to some degree conventional. It's the observer who decides what's the boundary. 
in principle, any system can be taken as big as you want or as small as you want. For example, in a social system, I can look at one village, one family, one group of villages, uh, one province, one country, one group of countries. These are all different systems at different levels and I can't really say what's the boundary. So you need to be a little bit pragmatic and usually you choose the boundary at the place that all the things that you are very much interested in are included and the things that you are somewhat less interested in are outside the boundary. So it's just a question of being practical and trying to find the right boundary. And uh, finally, your last question was about... Uh, the local character. Well, that was exactly what I said. Uh, consensus in say is not collective intelligence. The fact of consensus, like I showed with these examples, uh, like in uh, Bosnia, you get local consensus, but which is different from the consensus in a different region, and the two regions are in conflict. That is definitely not what we might call collective intelligence. So that is one of the dangers, but on the other hand, uh, this kind of local homogenization can be positive or it can be negative. If we think in terms of language, typically people like the idea of diversity, that there is more than one language. If there would be homogenization at the level of the world as a whole, as we discussed yesterday, probably everybody would be speaking English and all the other languages would get extinct. On the other hand, we also don't want every single village to have its own language. So it's, it's a trade-off. There is no simple solution of what is the best, more homogenization, less homogenization. But when I speak about collective intelligence, I don't mean this homogenization. The homogenization is, is at most a requirement for coordination. That at least you should be able to communicate. But being able to communicate, establishing common reference is not sufficient to be intelligent. Because you can be in full agreement about something that is completely stupid. That was my example of groupthink. So collective intelligence is a step more than just homogenization.